Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the bassoon. No, not the bassoon that you are familiar with. More an obscure member of the bassoon family that we seem to have forgotten about. Before we get to that particular instrument, I'd like to take a little look at how the bassoon section in the orchestra is typically composed. In a fairly large orchestra, we'll have two bassoons and one contrabassoon. This is a standard two plus one arrangement, three players. Sometimes the contrabassoon will also play bassoon. Now let's look at a little bit larger orchestra. It's made of four bassoon players, three bassoons and one contrabassoon. This is a standard three plus one arrangement. And again, the contrabassoon player can go over and play regular bassoon. But there's an interesting thing that happens when we get to a four bassoon arrangement. The first two bassoons typically play the tenor role. They have the higher passages, the more melodic areas. And bassoon three and contrabassoon have the bass roll. In fact, bassoon three and contrabassoon really are very similar players. And you can see this a lot in pieces like Daphnis and Chloe. Daphnis and Chloe is a fantastic piece to study for how Ravel uses the orchestra, one of the great orchestration masterworks out there. But in studying the third bassoon part in Daphnis and Chloe, I came to a realization. He treats third bassoon like a high contrabassoon part. In essence, it's almost always doubling the contrabassoon an octave higher. Why does Ravel do this? It seems to be an odd choice. Could there be a better way to treat the third bassoon? Well, that's where our mysterious instrument comes in. There weren't always just two members of the bassoon family. There used to be quite a few. But over the years, it seems that we've forgotten some of the more unusual members. And I'd like to make a case for reinventing one of those lost members. It's a bassoon pitched midway between the regular bassoon, and the contrabassoon. Perhaps one of the reasons that we don't see this instrument anymore is nobody's ever come up with a good name for it. A lot of times you'll see it referred to as a semi-contrabassoon, or a half-contrabassoon, or a great bass bassoon, or even bass bassoon. But the redundancy of the word bass in the two words there leads to a little bit of confusion. An instrument pitched lower than the regular bassoon is not a new concept. In fact, it is quite old, dating all the way back to the Renaissance era in the early Baroque. The instrument back then was known as a dulcian, or a kirtle, depending on your country of origin. And one of the popular members of the dulcian family was the great bass or quart bass. Quart bass simply meaning that it was pitched one-fourth below the bass. In this case, it would have been an instrument in G, so that its lowest note would be G1. However, the instrument did not make it into the Baroque era, and by the classical era was completely forgotten about. By the end of the Romantic era, the contrabassoon, a full octave lower than the regular bassoon, had begun to take over. Although, there were a few composers who still remembered that the old semi-contras were still out there. And you would have rumors of them popping up every now and then. This gentleman is Charles-Marie Vidor. Vidor was most well-known as an organist. However, Vidor was also an excellent composer and composition teacher. He wrote an 
excellent treatise on orchestration. And in that treatise, he devotes a whole section to this particular instrument. The passage in Vidor's treatise, where he talks about the instrument, which he calls a bassoon quint, meaning a bassoon one-fifth lower than the regular bassoon, meaning it would be an instrument in F, he describes like this. The bassoon quint has not yet been made, but bassoon players are calling for it. It would form the true base of the woodwind group, a fifth below the standard instrument, descending consequently to E flat, a semitone lower than the double bass. The low A, which Wagner wrote below B flat, is admirably rich and full. Then, Say professionals, why not descend to E flat with the same fingering and the same capabilities as the ordinary bassoon? We have already seen that the low fifth from double B flat to double F is sufficiently robust to bear any weight of sound. The new low fifth would be still more robust. The bassoon quint is said to be easy of construction. We look to the instrument makers to provide us with it in the near future. What Vidor may not have known is that such an instrument had already been built, and it was owned by this gentleman, Captain Mutton Chops. I mean, Sir Arthur Sullivan. Sir Arthur Sullivan, of course, is famous for his work with his partner Gilbert, a.k.a. Gilbert and Sullivan. Sir Sullivan did own a semi contrabassoon in F. It was not of standard design, though. In fact, this instrument is rumored to have been made of paper mache. As such, the instrument probably does not exist to this day and would have easily worn out. This chart shows the potential range of a modern semi contrabassoon in F, going all the way down to E flat 1 below the bass clef and up to a written high C, which would sound F4 just above middle C. It's the bassoon's standard range transposed down a fifth. To give an idea of what a semi contrabassoon would sound like, We'll take a look at Brahms. Brahms wrote in his Violin Concerto an exposed passage for the second bassoon. This is from the second movement. It's a duet between the first oboe. This is one of the rare examples in orchestral literature of sustained low note playing in an exposed excerpt. One of the few excerpts that is in the low register. What I will do is I will take this excerpt and first you'll hear me play it on the regular bassoon. And then I will take the same excerpt and my audio manipulation I will transpose it down a fifth so you can hear a rough estimation of what a semi bassoon will sound like.
now for the version a fifth lower. As you can hear, the sound of the bassoon transposed down a fifth is warm and rich. It doesn't have quite the gruffness that the contrabassoon will. It's a wonderful instrument for low solos, for adding some extra harmony, and for extending the range of the normal bassoon section downwards. An added benefit is that it is going to be more cost-effective to produce than a contrabassoon will be, simply because it won't have as complex of a mechanism because it doesn't need to be as folded as the contrabassoon is. It's an interesting idea for revitalization. If we take a look at the full bassoon family, we might now have a section of a tenor bassoon on top two regular bassoons, the semi-contra, and the contra bassoon down at the bottom. Extend this one step further, and my friend Richard Bobo is now making a sub-contra bassoon, a full octave lower still than the regular contra bassoon, that'll extend the range of the family down another octave. And in fact, the whole band, or the whole orchestra, an extra octave. That is an exciting possibility. But let's not forget the lost member of the family and one that could easily be resurrected. <laughs> 